Hi, and welcome to She Said, She Said. I'm Laura Cox Kaplan. I'm so happy to have you with us today. My special guest is journalist and amazing talent, Mary Catherine Ham. And Mary Catherine, for those who don't know, went through an incredibly difficult experience. She lost her husband, Jake, when the couple had a toddler at home and she was pregnant with their second baby. She wrote a piece for Atlantic Magazine a couple of weeks ago talking about the importance of perspective and looking at this notion of perspective through the lens of what so many people parents and non-parents alike are going through right now. I'm really excited to have her join me today. Mary Catherine, welcome to She Said, She Said. Thank you so much for having me. Glad to be here. Well, I'm delighted to have you. Let's start off. You're the mom of two little ones. How are you guys doing with virtual education, homeschooling, whatever variable you're trying to embrace here? Uh, we're doing pretty well, I would say. We have a, um, my two girls are both extreme extroverts, as am I. So it, that part's a little tough on us. I'm glad I bred my own extrovert friends so that I can have them in the house with me. Uh, but they are getting a little desperate. Like when I explain to them if we're at the park or if we're out walking that they can't make new friends, that is anathema to them. Uh, so that's been a bummer for them. But largely they seem really happy to be at home with me and be getting all this attention from me. So that part's good. They're, they're coping pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Um, as I told you before we got started, you've been on my list of folks to have on this podcast. I have admired you uh, for so many years and really just thrilled to have you. But the particular prompt for this conversation was this incredible piece very personal piece that you wrote for The Atlantic a couple of weeks ago about the experience that you had, and it's all about perspective. And if you would, I'd love for you to talk to us about what you experienced and why you felt the need to write this piece. Yeah, so I wrote a piece for The Atlantic um, about parenting through this coronavirus era. Uh, and the reason I wrote it is because as it was starting to unfold, I felt a little bit of a familiar feeling because, uh, and I realized what it was like a weekend. I was like, oh, this is parenting in a crisis situation. That's what this feels like. Um, and I had done that before because in 2015, um, my husband passed away uh, suddenly in a cycling accident. Uh, I was seven months pregnant with our second child. So I had a two, two year old at home and I was in late pregnancy when this happened. Um, and not to say that it's, the same, you know, extreme nature as that event, but there, many of my friends were feeling some of the same things. There is grief for this life that happened before the pandemic. There's this drastic life change for everyone where their kids are home with them all the time and they're having to embrace something completely different than they've been doing in the past. It's quite stressful if you're trying to work full time with your kids at home um, and sort of adapting to all of that had a similar kind of feel and I thought, well, maybe if I talk about a couple things that I did to adjust, that could help people adjust to their new normal. Cause this was just as people, as the schools were starting to say like, they ain't going back. Mm -hmm. And my friends were just like, what am I going to do? Right. Um, and so one of the things, the first thing that prompted this was I saw a bunch of people doubting themselves in public, which obviously you're allowed to doubt yourself. I do it all the time. Um, and moms but, in particular, right? Yeah. As women, <laughs> but, that's something we tend to do yeah. pretty naturally. Right, we can do that a little too naturally sometimes. Right. So I thought to, it, it discouraged me because I know that all of my friends are so capable and a lot of these people I saw telling themselves, well, I'm not a homeschool mom. I'm not this mom. I'm not that mom. I'm not a Pinterest mom. And I thought, okay, well, let's, let's give ourselves the opportunity to say, I can be a different kind of mom. Like th this is a, this is not a fun situation, but it's a transition we must make. And so how do we deal with that? Um, and approaching it in that way, like I am gonna be this kind of person, doesn't have to be the perfect mom, just I'm gonna be this new kind of thing, gets you down the road to being that thing better than going, oh, this is terrible, what am I gonna do? And that, that's just something I picked up from my very traumatic <laughs> transition period, which was like, I'm gonna control what I can control, which is I'm gonna write this story for myself. And I literally wrote it, I wrote a eulogy. And in the eulogy, 
I asked my friends and family three days after Jake died to hold me accountable for two things, that we would not live mired in sadness and that we would not be, I put it as a, a sad trombone in every room we walked into. Mm -hmm. And two, because I, like, I foresaw that. I was like, this is very sad. I get it. We, we remind people of mortality. We remind people of this sad story. Please don't let us be that. Mm -hmm. And then number two, that I wanted to live unafraid, that we wanted to, you know, take life by the horns, do things that we did before Jake died and not feel like I had to shelter my children. You know, Mary um, Catherine, it's, it is such a level, I'm amazed at the level of self-awareness that right. you had, I mean, so quickly after you were, you were obviously still in the grief phase. This was oh, yeah. a couple of days after this happened. Yeah. Where did that self-awareness come from for you? Um, I think it, it was a combination of two things. One, those were my two biggest fears. Mm -hmm. And what I did was I just flipped it and said, these are, <laughs> I flipped my fears and said, these are my intentions moving forward. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew if I said those things out loud, that people would be looking at me. I hoped that people would look at me differently, that I would hold myself accountable, that they would hold me accountable. Um, and that really is what happened. And the second thing is like, some of this was just like, God looked down and was like, here's what you need, sweetie. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Some of it really was that. My second born um, was the easiest newborn this planet has ever seen. <laughs> and I consider that those three months that she was just the most perfect, uncrying, eating, sleeping dream, uh, that was a gift from God too. He's like, look, you've had, you've had your share. Uh, here's a nice baby. <laughs> and so that was, to me, that sort of weird perspective on what I wanted my life to look like was part spiritual and part practical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you talk about in the piece the importance of self-compassion as well. Yeah. In, in being kind to yourself and recognizing that you may not be able to be that great parent all day long. You may only be able to master that, you know, a couple of hours a day right. and that's okay. Talk a little bit about how you established these benchmarks and what the routine began to look right. like and really how you put one foot in front of the other from a just a practical, just a practical. standpoint. Yeah. yeah, so one thing I knew and one thing I, I urge parents to think about in this time is I actually, I'm so glad I had kids during that because I knew why I was getting up in the morning. Wow. I was getting up in the morning and this is how, this is what I made my first goal was get up in the morning, literally just get out of bed was number one. Uh, and number two, I started a ritual where I made breakfast for my kids. Um, first one kid and then the other after she came. But um, warm breakfast to me was like a symbol that I could provide for them. It was my favorite meal of the day. And most importantly, it got me started on a decent foot. So if I could do that, it was one little victory in the morning that I could then either build off of, or like I said, if I had one little victory a day, that was fine sometimes. Like go and watch soap operas or whatever for the rest of the day. Um, because grief can be very exhausting and you maybe don't have that much in you. Uh, so that's what I did. And that's actually, um, one of the, that I write about in the piece. Um, some of the psychologists who study resilient families, one of the things they suggest after loss or divorce, these big transitions is to create new traditions. And so that was, breakfast became our thing. I made bacon every morning <laughs> and I was like, this is going to make us feel better even for just a few minutes a day. Um, and so that sort of building off of that every morning made me feel every morning like, okay, I'm sort of handling this. I'm getting out of bed and I made my kids breakfast. Like, and if that was all I got done, fine. If I, you know, got three more things done, huge gold star day, right? <laughs> and so um, understanding that tomorrow was a day to reset and that I could do that every morning uh, helped me. One of the things that I was so frustrated with when they started announcing that schools were closed till the end of the year was that parents who had just been thrown into this situation were like, okay, a month. I can do this for a month. And then you're in crisis and someone says, no, you're going to do this forever, which is what that feels like, right? When you're in crisis and when you're stressed out, like many parents are right now, move half a day at a time, move a day at a time, get through Monday, get through breakfast, get through lunch, whatever it is, and then give yourself a little break. Even, I know the breaks are hard to come by, even if it's just in the bathroom for five minutes and you have to lock the door. <laughs> Like, so, so like keeping that, that 
timeline short and giving yourself a break when you've hit even very small goals, I think is important just to, for trucking along, which is what we have to do right now. Yeah. Because your girls were so young when <clears throat> this happened to you, was that sort of from your standpoint a blessing maybe in the fact that they were maybe not as aware of right. what was going on? What, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's both a blessing and, you know, all the things that are in a tra tragic right. situation can have a silver lining. And one of the things was that I was basically only dealing with my trauma, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, was, that was what I had to deal with. And I've, I've talked to other folks whose children were much older when this happened to them. And then, you know, you're dealing with a lot more than I was. Um, my oldest, my oldest was only two. Uh, now she was sort of like, to my mind, a perfect age, if there can be, because she sort of has memories of him, but she has no trauma from it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the youngest, it's just sort of matter of fact, she was born and she never knew him, but she knows about him. Right. Um, and one of the things that's nice for them is that the older sister can tell the little sister yeah. a little bit, the little tiny bit that she does actually remember. Um, or that I've helped her sort of establish, like some of those memories she had, I'm sure have been embellished by me, but whatever they are, uh, she tells her those stories. Um, and so that I think helped, helped me a bit for sure. Yeah. You talk about the different stages of grief, which most people are very familiar with. Right. In the piece, you talk about how they may present themselves out of order or yes. at different times in which you're sort of not expecting it. Talk a little bit about what you meant by that. Yeah, so everybody knows the sort of anger, bargaining, depression, and then acceptance is sort of like way down at the end of the line. Yeah. And studies and studies show and clinical stuff shows that, that a lot of these things can hit you at the same time. You can have bargaining and depression and anger before lunchtime, like if you're in a bad situation. Um, and then my argument is don't wait for acceptance to come because like we're, <laughs> you don't have to work through all that to get there. You can just say, wow, this situation kind of sucks and it is what we have before us um which is i sort of forced myself to do that um if there was any time of denial in my situation it was about a four-hour car ride until i got from my home where i got the call about jake my late husband until i got to my daughter who was with my mother-in-law at the time logistical explanation but i happened to be on the road mm -hmm. so it was about a four-hour car ride and I thought, maybe this didn't really happen during that four hour car ride. And when I got out of the car, I thought, nope, this happened and you need to deal with it. Um, and so I think the quicker you can make yourself wrap your brain around whatever the hard thing is you're dealing with um, and just start putting one foot in the front of the other, it will do you some good. And you can deal with the depression and the anger and the bargaining as you're walking through that. Yeah, yeah. Talk a little bit about some of the other things that were helpful to you. I know you mentioned the book, which I also love, Atomic Habits. Right. Talk about how that was helpful to you and the perspective that you gained from that. Yeah, I think, I, so I accidentally stumbled into identity-based habits, which is something James Clear writes about in Atomic Habits. Um, instead of putting a bunch of stuff on a to-do list after my husband died, like I'm going to make breakfast for my kids. That wasn't what I told myself. What I told myself was, I'm the mom of a, hep, a happy, healthy family. That's what I am. Um, and something sad happened to us, but we are not sad every day. So I'm going to get up and do the things that a mom of a happy, healthy family does. Um, that slight difference made me believe that I could do the things that were on my to-do list any given day. Um, and that made it much more likely that I would stick to those things. So that's that's why I say to friends who were saying, who were saying, I'm not a homeschool mom. Well, don't kick yourself while you're down, man. Like, let's, <laughs> let's, let's first of all, know that we are capable people and that as parents, we have changed in ways we never dreamed possible before we were parents. And this is another season to do that. Um, so I think believing, it, it sounds so cheesy to say that believing in yourself can be a first step, but it actually can. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah. and that's not just, uh, it's not just mumbo jumbo. There's actual studies that back up the idea that if you believe a task is within you, mm -hmm. if you believe, for instance, that you're going to be a piano player, your habits will follow that belief instead of you making yourself into a musician. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that was something I accidentally stumbled into and then I read Atomic Habits and I thought, oh my gosh, that's what I did. Yeah. Um, so that's one reason I was telling people just, you know, don't naysay your own abilities from the very beginning because it won't help you move forward. 
Yeah, yeah. Talk about, because you've had an opportunity to really, you know, reflect on all of this, talk about how you were raised, what role your upbringing may have had in terms of how you you immediately set out to tackle this situation in the most positive, productive way possible, even under the circumstances. Talk about how your upbringing may have had an impact on how you thought about this. Yeah, well, and I, I also, not just my upbringing, but my parents in real time, I, I should say my parents and family in real time. Uh, my brother uh, moved in with us after my husband passed away immediately. He had a wow. job where he did not need to be in the town that he was in. We had a guest room. And, um, and so he came for the funeral and he never left. Oh, wow. he, he stayed for six months and he helped raise kids with me. He fixed things. He took out trash. He did all the things that were like so seemed so heavy to me um, that were just basic tasks every day. Uh, so number one, that helped me through along with my parents coming up uh, from their hometown, you know, from my old hometown, basically every weekend just to help out with the same kind of stuff and keep yeah. me up. Um, but I think I come from that sort of shows. I come from a family that is very practical, I would say, like, not, and it's not as if there's no emotion to deal with or anybody is discouraged from dealing with it, but there is a practicality in like, well, here we are. What steps do we take now? We are a family that wants to like, okay, well, what, what's the thing I can do to help? Maybe clean the gutters. Like it's <laughs> very, <laughs> it's so, done. <laughs> and actually I tell people this too, who are looking ways to looking for ways to help people who are in crisis. Um, Cause I know sometimes it can be hard to know what to do sometimes those very practical things you can take off someone's plate are really the best things to do. One of the most wonderful things anyone did for me uh, was right after my husband died, my neighbors who I barely knew at the time, now they're, you know, very close friends. Um, they started mowing my lawn. Oh. I just didn't have to think about it. And they did it when I was gone. So I wouldn't feel guilty about it. They're just the most wonderful oh. people. So simple things like that, we're like, I just didn't have to set up a lawn service. I didn't have to do the mowing the lawn when I had a newborn, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, so I think partly that with my upbringing, partly that, uh, and I tell the story a little bit in the Atlantic piece um, about my grandmother was widowed when she, her kids weren't young. Uh, her youngest was late high school when she was widowed. But I watched her go, you know, I knew that this had happened to her. I never knew my grandfather. And I watched her live a very happy, positive, faith-filled life with a second marriage that was very full and long. Um, and so, and that was her childhood sweetheart. I mean, this was a, <laughs> this is a very, very big deal with whom she raised three children. Um, and she just was such an independent, strong woman. Uh, she was a Navy wave who lived by herself in DC, like with uh, her girlfriend roommates uh, in the 40s during World War II. Um, she went back home and married her uh, her childhood sweetheart after the war. She had a college education. She played college basketball at one point. I mean, she was such a cool lady. Yeah. And so having her to look at and think, okay, well, I, I know someone who's been through this and who made a really, really full life for herself. Um, so that helped me. I have a locket of hers that my grandfather gave her that I wore after Jake died pretty regular. I should have put it on for this podcast <laughs> and I still wear um, pretty regularly uh, because it just is a nice reminder that, well, someone I love and know very well went through this and, uh, and created a wonderful life for herself. So that plus I think, and I always sh should mention that like that my faith helped me through. I mean, there was so much prayer and so many people praying for me mm -hmm. um, that, you know, all the anxiety that comes with this and all of the up in the middle of the night, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I was so helped just by thinking, okay, I don't understand this, but someone does. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to talk to him about it, even if I'm super angry about it. Um, that was very helpful to me. Yeah. Talking to other people who have been through something somewhat similar, um, Cheryl Sandberg comes to mind when she lost her husband, Dave. Um, knowing how to talk to and comfort someone, you talked about things that people can do, just those little gestures and how much that means. But, but give people some advice for how to talk to someone who's gone through a loss like this. Um, you know, Cheryl talked about how people would constantly ask her, how are you doing? <laughs> you know, how do you think I'm doing? This is yeah. really, really horrible. Yeah. Give us some advice for how people can, can show 
their empathy, their sympathy, um, and, and be helpful at the same yeah. time. Yeah, I think um, a lot of people get a little a little paralyzed. Yeah. By, okay, well, what's my entry point here? How do I? This is such a big thing. How do I deal with it? Um, uh, one ki one thing that I do when I'm checking up on people, which by the way, we should all be doing now, especially people who are living alone, I think. Um, one of the questions I ask people, which does not minimize whatever they're going through, um, but gives you an injury point is just, how are you holding up? Mm -hmm. How are you holding up? Not how are you doing like a normal question, but like, I know this is tough. How are you holding up? Um, is maybe a better way to phrase that that might help you feel like you're not being flippant. Um, Number two is like when people are going through something really tough, they didn't forget about it. So like you're not, to me, it was never like, you're not reminding me of something bad that happened if you check in about it. I welcome it. Um, so that was always fine for me. And I like, if you don't want to make a phone call or if you don't want to make a visit, a text message is fine. An email is fine. Tons of people email, emailed. Now don't expect a response if somebody is very, <laughs> very in the thick of crisis. Right. Um, there were so many text messages and emails and notes that I remember and they meant a lot to me that I'm sure those people don't know that that was the case because I didn't have energy to inform them of that. Um, so don't expect a, a response necessarily. Um, I mentioned some of the practical things that you can take off a friend's plate. Um, you know, if it's something where they're, com if they're very comfortable with you and you can take their three-year-old or, so or something, on a quick ice cream date and just get them out of the house for a minute. Uh, that's a nice thing to be able to do for people. And then one thing I've done for folks, which is, it, this sounds so silly, but it, it helped me. Um, several people just brought me really comfy new clothes, like just like Target pajamas or um, a friend of mine, Ryan Mannion, who works for the Travis Mannion Foundation, which is a, a, a vet, veterans organization I work with. She brought me a bunch of like, Travis Mannion gear that was like athletic gear and really comfortable. But the thing about it was, it was new. It was cute. It didn't have any memories attached to it. And I felt like a human when I wore it instead of just like, Ooh. Yeah. Um, so like comfy stuff like that, pajama pants, uh, care package type stuff. Like somebody brought me nail polish, which I actually really enjoyed because any of that self care stuff, you're not in the mindset to do that. But if it's sitting right in front of me, I was like, oh, I, I could read a, a silly fashion magazine and do my nails for half an hour. I could do that. Um, so sort of that kind of self-care stuff I found nice that would just arrive on my doorstep. And I'm like, oh, new tea. I can enjoy that for 15 minutes. <laughs> um, so those are a couple of the things uh, that I found to be helpful. They're sort of practical and small. Um, but the main thing is, I think, just shoot a text. Like, no, you know, you're not to me, like I was never bothered by that. Um, whereas, you know, if someone disappears on you because they're uncomfortable, that could be something that hurts you, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas a little quick text is like, yeah, that's, it doesn't bother me at all. Yeah, yeah. You are so authentic and so transparent and so gracious in your willingness to share your story with people so that it can help them. You're also very authentic as it relates to your persona on social media. <laughs> and for anyone who follows you on social media, as I told you before we started, I feel like I've known Mary Catherine for years, even though we really just met, because she is very transparent with her life and what you show. And when you talk about um, breakfast as being this sort of defining moment for your family and part of that routine that you established, you've posted that on Instagram. I've seen you yes. making bacon. Yes. <laughs> it's very relatable. What's interesting in this moment in time is that we're seeing a lot of high profile people in a much more natural state. Right. What do you think about, do you think this becomes maybe one of the benefits that comes out of this experience is people being a bit more authentic with who they are and what they're sharing on these platforms. Yeah. Um, oh, it's, it's funny that you say this, by, by the way, because occasionally I'll get somebody who messages me like, uh, oh, I'll, I'll reply to them and they'll say, Whoa, who is this? Who's running your stuff? And I'm like, oh, you think someone runs this? Like this, this it would not look like this if a professional like communications person was it running it. It wouldn't feel as real right. if you had somebody else doing it. Right. And that's not what I'm going for. Um, look, I think, I think that it is good to get a glimpse into people's lives. Um, I think, uh, there's some, I saw some funny, uh, internet piece the other day where they were ranking like people's backgrounds at their houses. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, I don't know how mine would come in in the, 
sparse guest room uh, where I can hide from my children. But um, but no, I do think it's it's interesting to watch how people, what people get involved with during their quarantine time. Um, and they take on new projects. And for me, I hadn't written in a while. So it was nice to sit down and do this Atlantic piece. Um, but I also try to, one of the things I like to do is I do, I try to do serious work mm -hmm. on a regular basis. And then I try to do silly work mm -hmm. on a regular basis <laughs> because it makes me feel good. And partly this actually comes from uh, when, right after Jake died, one of the things I found most valuable uh, was just podcasts or shows that were completely silly and had nothing to do with pondering life's great questions. I was like, I'm doing enough of that. So I find great value in silliness. And one of the things that you can watch people follow their passions through this uh, quarantine period, things that they wanted to do in the past. And one of the things I'm doing is I'm doing a silly fashion Instagram called Oldest Delia's Model, which for people in my age uh, bracket who were in, in high school in the 90s, this is like the aspirational uh, teen guide to fashion that we were all in on. And I've decided that I'm just recreating those looks from whatever's in my closet uh, while I'm at the house. <laughs> and so I've been having a lot of fun with that. So can um, people follow you on your normal MK Hammer Time yes. um, Instagram? Okay. MK Hammer Time. And then I have, I started a separate one that I'll, I'll link there called Oldest Delia's Model. Okay. And you can, you can check out both of them for yeah, all. We'll silliness. make sure and put that in the show notes for the episode as well, because we don't want to miss that. <laughs> no, but I do think, I also, I do think that silliness, seek it out when you're in a time of stress, because uh, having a moment or two, like instead of following the news cycle 24 seven, having a moment or two where you're just laughing at someone doing something dumb, that's good for you. You should... <laughs> Yeah. Embrace it. <laughs> You've got some other great things that you're involved with. The Lady Brains podcast. I love the title of that podcast is another, but it's both sometimes silly, but it's super serious and in depth as well, or can be. Talk a little bit about that and what that is and some of the other things that you're working on. Yeah. So the Lady Brains podcast is a group of, uh, a group of women who are all across the country, but we had we had become friends through sort of pol politics and news stuff. Um, but we have a bunch of other interests. Uh, so the Lady Brains podcast is on iTunes or wherever you subscribe to podcasts, and we're all over the country. One in one in Denver, one in LA, one in Chicago, and three here on uh, the East Coast. And we just talk about not politics. That's <laughs> the idea is to get together and not talk about the thing that we all do for a living. Right. Um, so one of my friends is a homesteader out in Denver. Uh, and so she talks about canning and gardening and her, you know, all of her goats. There's a lot of goat content. <laughs> um, and then one, we're all very different. One of the friends is a vegan uh, here in DC and she talks about all her uh, very she-she lifestyle stuff, <laughs> which is very different from my not very shishi lifestyle stuff. Um, but we have a nice time. We just like women talking about things that don't have to be the uh, hard charging, very sometimes strife ridden stuff we do on a daily basis for work. Yeah. Uh, we take our other passions and, and, and channel them. One of them also is a matchmaker. That's very fun. Oh, wow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> have to have her on. That's we've yeah, not had a matchmaker she, on. <laughs> it's fascinating. So she she's married with uh, with twins, and she does uh, you know con consulting for people and puts them on dates together and gives them hard you know tough love advice. Uh, wow. And, yeah. So fantastic. It's a strange and fun group of friends. Yeah, absolutely. So Mary Catherine, we ask everybody who comes on the podcast for a single piece of advice, a life hack or a mantra. You've already given us incredible advice and perspective. And I'm so grateful that you were willing to share this. I know it's a very personal story. Yeah. It, will re it resonates so deeply with me and I know it will with our audience as well. But if you had to boil down to one thing, maybe your North Star that you tell yourself, what would that be? Yeah, so this actually comes from that piece, but it's something I think about a lot. And it's something I think I thought about right after Jake died a lot. Uh, and, and it's applicable now for basically everyone, which is um, perspective is a gift of tragedy. Uh, we are going through, as a country, as a world, we are going through a really tough time. And some people are have, you know, have a more flexible situation than others. Others are gonna have a tougher economic time and tougher times in general but we're all going through something. Um, and the perspective that that brings you when we come out on the other side of this 
uh, can give you, if you embrace it, really great joy in small things that you did not find joy in before. I mean, I've been through a bad thing before and you would think I have all the perspective I need. And yet when this happened, I was like, I did not realize how much I enjoyed going to Aldi for 30 minutes just to grab something. Like I didn't know how great that was. Right. Um, and I think that like that perspective truly, if you think about it and try to try to think about it on a regular basis, uh, can bring really great joy to your life moving forward, especially when we, when we have come out the other side of this thing and we will come out the other side of this thing. Um, so that, I think that would be my main thing. One of the things I did after Jake died is I read a lot of history about women who had been through what I had been through, but in way tougher times. <laughs> like I had, I had a job, I could make a living. I owned my stuff. It didn't go to my husband's family. You know, like the, all these sort of things that I needed to tell myself were blessings, even when it didn't feel like I was terribly blessed. Um, I thought about that hard when I was in tough places. And I think that's something that this can give us, even though looking for silver linings in tough things can be discouraging, but they really are there. Yeah, for sure. Oh my gosh. Mary Catherine, thank you so much. This was truly fantastic. I really, really loved having you. To learn more about my amazing guest, Mary Catherine Ham, check out the show notes for this episode, episode 99. I'll include some additional details as well as some photographs and links to Mary Catherine's social media handles. And if you're enjoying She Said, She Said, I also hope you'll go to the website and sign up for our weekly newsletter. It's a great piece that we send out every week, usually on Fridays or Saturdays. I include content to complement each week's episodes, as well as some other materials and content that I think you will find interesting, inspiring, and hopefully insightful. Most of all, I greatly appreciate the investment of your time, both with the podcast and with our new YouTube channel. I'm very, very grateful to have you as part of this growing community. It means so much. As always, thanks for listening. Be safe and be well.